This is Newsmax TV. I'm Ashley Martella. One of the closest U.S. Senate races in the country is in West Virginia. The special election November 2nd is for the seat left vacant by the death of Democrat Robert Byrd, who held the seat for 51 years. Governor Joe Manchin, the Democrat, is running against Republican John Racy. He is a businessman. He's president and CEO of Greer Industries, a steel and limestone producer. Mr. Racy has other business interests as well, and his companies employ about 1,000 people. He's also a strong conservative, and we're happy to have him with us in the studio right now. Welcome to Newsmax, John. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Manchin's a popular governor, yet polls have you up by a few points. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Well, I, I think the dichotomy is fairly interesting because as a governor and state issues, I think a lot of people in West Virginia possibly agree that he's done a fair job. But when we start talking about national issues, issues like the stimulus or Obamacare or cap and trade, that's when it starts to deviate a lot. And he hasn't been right on those issues. He's been a very early supporter of Barack Obama. And uh, what we've tried to do is show that there is a different governor in the state of West Virginia on state issues. But if you send that popular to, uh, governor to uh, Washington, then you're going to have no more than what we say is a rubber stamp going to uh, Washington to be a rubber stamp for Barack Obama. Uh, you've accused Manchin of lying when he told a West Virginia Gazette reporter that he would not have voted for Obamacare had he been in the Senate. Why do you say that? Well, he was for it before he was against it. I, I find that odd. But when you, you look at Joe, and we certainly have so many news clips of him, uh, saying that he is for Obamacare, saying that he is for health care reform, saying a lot of initiatives that uh, are, are in Obamacare would be good for West Virginia. And as you know, I think that Obamacare needs to be repealed as fast as we can. And I, I think that if Governor Manchin is really for Obamacare, like now that he's done a 360, he ought to offer the same statement that I offer. Let's repeal it. Instead, he just wants to tweak it a little bit. All right. You say you'd like to be the 51st vote to repeal, in your words, mm -hmm. this disastrous Obamacare bill. Right. Now, say you're elected, but there are fewer than 51 Republicans. You don't have a majority, but you have a lot more Republicans than you do now. Would right. there be any chance of a repeal vote if you're not in the majority, but you do pick up quite a few seats? I think there'd be a wonderful chance, and it sort of reminds me of Ronald Reagan when he got together with Tip O'Neill, and we didn't have majorities back then when Reagan was president. And a lot of it is just working with coalitions of like-minded senators, working and showing leadership. And as you know, Reagan made a hero out of Tip O'Neill because what did we do? We lowered the hot top rate tax level in the United States, and when we did that, there was a great deal of success. So I, I pride myself on coalition development. I pride myself on with working with people, and that's what you do in the certainly in the outside sector, out of government, is you've got to put people together. All right, cap and trade may be on the back burner now, but if Democrats retain control of the Senate, you know it's coming back. Harry Reid may even try to ram it through during that lame duck session. Mm -hmm. Now, critics say it, be, it would be disastrous for energy-producing states like West Virginia, yours. Now, what's your take on it? What would be its effect? And what could you do about it, possibly? Well, as you know, cap and trade has nothing to do with environmentalism. It has nothing to do with, uh, uh, certainly, global warming. What it has to do with with is government control of manufacturing, plain and simple. And in West Virginia, it would be disastrous. We are obviously a coal producing state. But I, I obviously also know that the EPA has the ability, if they consider CO2 as a dangerous toxin, to implement a, uh, a more stringent, uh, excuse me, a, a very tough version of cap and trade. And that can be done by Ms. Jackson and Ms. Browner. So I'm very concerned that we have to stand up as a, as a united people in this country and to, to make sure that we don't have any of those reservations and laws coming at us. Cap and trade would be a disaster for this country, not only West Virginia. All right, you mentioned in a recent interview that uh, you were concerned about the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court as regards the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Please tell us why you're concerned. Well, you know, we have a very, very, I think, controversial situation in this country when you start to look at the United Nations and the United Nations ability or the proposed ability that they would like to sort of take over what we do as far as the Second Amendment in this country. And when you look at the uh, United States Supreme Court, we have five favorable judges right now that favor the Second Amendment right, and we certainly have four that don't. Uh, I'm concerned when the, obviously the next retirement on the states or United States Supreme Court comes, who is going to make up that replacement to make the tilt and the average of, and the balance, excuse me, of the Supreme Court, in what direction are they going? And when you look at the vote that uh, most recently, where you look at Washington, and you certainly look at the city of, um, of Chicago and the city of San Francisco, there are three vital areas where our Second Amendment rights have been violated. So the question becomes, 
uh, if we're going to send a senator from West Virginia, that both are very strong with the uh, National Rifle Association and certainly Second Amendment rights, but who is that senator going to follow in the nomination process of our next Supreme Court Justice? So uh, I think my record is very clear who I would be following and what allegiances I have. I would question that Democrat, and I would also question the National Rifle Association. All right. Al at. Although West Virginians voted overwhelmingly for John McCain in the last presidential election, right. West Virginia has not elected a Republican senator in over half a century. How do you explain that? Well, I, I think Floyd Patterson was the heavyweight champion the last time that we did elect one. But I, I think that when you look at the, the growing advance of knowledge in West Virginia, and certainly with the advent of Fox uh, Television and what Fox has done is just educated the electorate all across the United States today. And it's a wonderful thing. When you look at the advent of the Tea Parties today that, uh, that believe, and as I do, firmly in the Constitution and the power of the Constitution, the education level of the American voter today is on a, a level I have never seen in my life. And it's the best thing that's happened to this country in a long, long time. And so we're seeing a change in a and a move in the right direction in this country, and we certainly welcome it. You ran for statewide office three previous times, mm -hmm. twice for the U.S. Senate and once for governor. Now, twice you lost by very slim margins. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from those previous attempts that might propel you over the top this time? Don't lose. <laughs> you got to win. And I say the, the biggest thing and the biggest obstacle that you always have is perception. Can you win? Especially in a democratic state, it's almost two to one Democratic versus Republican. But once again, I go back to what I have learned in the past and the fact that there are ways, I think, to present, to present your package and to present what you're for that hasn't changed much in 26 years. I'm a very conservative person. I believe in conservative principles. Small government is best government, and I think that resonates today more than it has ever in my political career. And once again, I'm, I'm really depending on an electorate today in West Virginia that represents, I think, the same values that I do, and I think it's going to be a much different outcome. What do you think your successful career as a businessman employing people would help you bring to the table in the U.S. Senate to spur economic growth and job creation? Well, I think it would bring, mean a lot because I'm, the, I'm a recipient of all the regulations that are popped at us every year and for coming from the United States Senate and certainly from Congress. And I think when you're on the receiving end instead of on the giving end, as a lot of our career bureaucrats have seemed to embellish themselves, I think it's a much different scenario. I think the other thing that's very important today is that a lot of people don't have to, I mean, a lot of people have to understand that corporate corporations in this country have to make money. They have to be profitable. And every time you have a new tax or every time that we have to pay, uh, 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 really pay uh, uh, an inordinate amount for a regulation is really stifling this country and certainly stifling, stifling American business. That's cost and that's cost as every way that we can possibly look at it. So today when you look at the amount of regulations that we've had coming at us, it totals almost $1.2 trillion aimed at American business. And I'd like to have the opportunity to have regulatory reform in this country to go in and certainly we need some regulations. I'm not saying that we don't. I'm saying that there should be some type of system in Congress today, in the United States Senate today, to hold the Constitution up and sit there and value between the Constitution and regulation. Does this regulation violate the Constitution? And I think it's a very good way to look at it. I think that we should have a litmus test on what we pass in the Senate and what we pass in Congress. Does it formulate with what we see in the Constitution today? And I'll bet it will be a pretty good sized percentage that they don't match up. And I'm a constitutionalist and I believe very firmly in that. One of the big issues to be settled among Republicans themselves is earmarks. Mm -hmm. Some say they should be allowed, majority says not. Uh, how do you feel about earmarks? Should well, they be allowed? I, I have to grab my ear when you said earmarks. And since 1994, which is an interesting figure, there have been 90,000 earmarks passed in this country. And I, I look at earmarks, are they representation, or is this taxation without representation? Are these grants without representation? Are they laws without, uh, in, without representation? And yes, they are. Because a lot of senators and a lot of congressmen give back to certain individual groups, or even individuals, these earmarks. They are not a reflection, I think, of the United States and certainly our citizenry. And even Bill Clinton, when you look at Bill Clinton and uh, former President Reagan, on a much related item was line item veto. Both of them were for it. And I think that we ought to eliminate earmarks, we ought to institute line item veto, and we ought to start running the government like a private sector business. I have that ability as CEO of my companies. I have line item veto, and if I didn't, 
I'd probably be out of business right now. Since yours is a special election, mm -hmm. if you win, you would be seated immediately. Mm -hmm. How big of a factor might that be in the lame duck Congress? Well, I think it would be a big, uh, a, big, uh, a, a big difference in what we're going to see because, you know, I would go in around November the 13th and you're in a lame duck session and I would just bet that there's going to be a lot of defeated liberal Republicans and Democratic senators in that lame duck session. And we have such, uh, such items in that session as the Bush tax cuts, as cap and trade. And uh, when you look at the importance of all of the above, you know that they're going to be and acted upon probably in that lame duck session. So I'm concerned. I, I, I certainly not only want to extend the Bush tax cuts, but I want to make them permanent. And I think that plays a lot into what maybe George Bush wanted to do in the first place. So I'm not just for extending. I want to make them permanent. And the best part about permanent there would be no more death tax in this country, and I think that's the killer for small business. Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate from West Virginia, John Racy, thanks so much, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Good luck on the campaign trail. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.